Thank you all very much. And Greg, thank you for your introduction. But more importantly, Greg, thank you for your leadership. Very proud of what you've done. It's been very easy taking over from your predecessor, whoever that was. <laughs> and you, you just, it, it, the, the ground was laid for you to look good. And uh, that you've done, and I appreciate your leadership and your friendship. To TPPF, there are people here who've been involved with TPPF a long time, people who may be relatively new to, T to TPPF. I cannot tell you enough how important you are to causes like this. This is what TPPF was made for. I want to try to begin tonight by helping you understand the framework that we operate under this night and going forward is this template that we must follow. And to put in context what I'm about to say, let me kind of go back to Greg Sindelar because he said something earlier that he always does whenever we're on the same stage together. He, he's an Aggie. I'm a Longhorn. He likes to needle me uh, about things like that, and, and it's fine. We find a way to bridge the divide. But tonight, we're unified. Unified in purpose, but also unified in ideology in a way you would not expect. Because I come to everybody tonight, Aggie, Longhorn, Red Raider, Cougar, whoever you are, I'm telling everybody here, we need to unite under one cause, and that is do not be like the Texas Longhorn football team. <laughs> Let me clarify and explain what I'm talking about. Because I know from the sound of all the Aggies here earlier, the, there's a lot of you who were not watching the UT football game this last Saturday. There are some Longhorns here, but they, they will want a reminder of what I'm talking about for others who don't care one way or the other. Let me give you the setting. It was the fourth quarter. Texas was down by a touchdown. Texas needed a touchdown. And by God, out of nowhere, there was a completion from Ewers to Jordan Whittington, and he broke loose. He was sprinting toward the goal line. He was going to tie the game. But he was tackled on the one-yard line. Easy enough. Just need a yard. Next snap, first and goal. One yard line, run it right through the middle, stuffed and stopped. Second down, hand it off, run it right up the middle, stuffed and stopped. By God, UT and the coach, they were not to be deterred. They were going to prove they were going to run it down their throat. Third down, hand off, run it up the middle, stuffed and stopped. Fourth and goal from the one-yard line. Need a touchdown to tie the game with time getting limited in the football game. So the coach calls a different play on fourth down. It's a short pass play. Completed, caught, gained, tackled for a one-half-yard game. <laughs> There's an Aggie saying it's beautiful. <laughs> UT took four downs from the one-yard line. And because of strategies, decision-making, play calls, and maybe execution, they could not get it from the one-yard line across the goal line. I want you to know where we stand tonight on the school choice issue. We stand tonight exactly where the University of Texas Longhorns stood when they were down at the one-yard line with four downs to go. For starters, we are in part in great shape because as we learned during the course of the meal tonight, the Senate has already passed school choice again. Now listen, that's, that's great, but Kennedy Lee, I think, is unexpected. I mean, it's, it's expected. I mean, it's, it's unsurprising because they pass it every time. We, we knew and perceived correctly they were going to pass it again. But here, to make sure I adjust your thinking, 
as we begin this last regular session, as we embark on this process to try to get school choice passed during the regular session, as Mandy and I were touring across the state of Texas, helping educators and legislators and average citizens and voters understand what we were doing, we began on probably our 20-yard line. But with day after day, we made yard after yard. We made first down after first down. And we got closer and closer and closer. And we, we knew that in the first special session, we had one task. And that was to pass the legendary property tax reform. But we also knew, everyone knew, there was a special session coming during which we would squarely address the issue head on about school choice in the state of Texas. It's given us time to continue to be involved in the education process, a process that TPPF has been engaged in more than any other entity in the state of Texas. And through that collective process from last January through February, March, April, May, it's been 10 yards at a time every single month, and that puts us on the one-yard line tonight because ever since about a week before the special session began, my office has been working with a team assembled in the Texas House of Representatives, and they have been working literally day and night to hammer out the details of a piece of legislation that I can approve before we see it get passed. And this is something that as we begin dining tonight, my office was working with those members of the House. They were working on a draft that was 181 pages long. A lot of nuance, a lot of detail to it. A lot of work still needs to be done. But knowing where the House membership is today, I can tell you as we begin this final push, we are on the one-yard line, a good place to be. And I want to express my gratitude to members of the Texas House of Representatives for listening to their constituents, listening to the people of Texas, because that's what they've heard over the course of pretty much the past year. They have listened to parents, parents who are extraordinarily frustrated about what's going on in some of their schools, parents who are angry about some things going on in their schools, tearful parents. There's one that, that Manny talks about frequently, about when we made a stop in Tyler, Texas, a woman who had a child with a learning disability who approached the administration of the public school her child was attending in, in Tyler, begging for help and eventually begging for mercy, only to be rebuffed by the administration, an administration who knew that mom had nowhere to go, no option, no choice. She didn't have the resources where she could up and move to a different school district. She did not have the resources where she could enroll in a private school. This mom was stuck. I've seen it in parents who came up to me. We were on stages like this, Mandy and I were, and afterwards we would stay there and, and talk to every single parent there. Everywhere that we went in the state of Texas, a similar story like this arose. Mom says, listen, I got three kids. One goes to the local public school. One goes to a private school. Another is homeschooled. And she would say, here's what I know. I know that where each of those children went is best for them. That mom knew far better than anybody else could ever know what is best for that child. Parents have the right by God to decide what is right for their child. And I know legislators have heard this next scenario also. There are kids who get bullied, not bullied for a day, not one 
fight that breaks out and then things resolve themselves and not one incident of maybe being bullied online or whatever the case may be. They are bullied through the entirety of a school year. And if you are a parent of means, you will take your child out of that school and get them into another school. But I know of tearful moms who work two jobs, who drop their child off to school, leaving that school crying, knowing that their child is going to be bullied that day, and then pick them up crying in advance, knowing they've had a horrific day. Then crying after they put their child to bed, praying to God, help me have something that can ex extract my child from this abusive situation. She can't write the check to go to a private school. She can't move to a different school. She has to see her child be beat and harmed and set back. And it does more than just lead to bullying. It affects that child mentally, emotionally, physically. It sets that child back. And what I know these legislators, especially in the House, have begun to learn we as a state have an obligation to each of those children that I've mentioned. We have an obligation to those kids who are getting bullied. Our obligation is to get them educated, to get, to get them to a safer place. And we can do that with a universal ESA program in the state of Texas. It's the right thing to do, the right thing to do for our parents, for our students. Someone who knows that well, and a man that I, I got to know during Mandy and my stops along the way, and Kennedy, Mandy was maybe one of the funnest, most entertaining, but maybe most uplifting times. We visited a place called the Rock. Yeah, some people know The Rock. If you haven't been to The Rock, you, you got to go to The Rock. we got with us here tonight Dr. Carson from The Rock in Houston, Texas. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for being with us every step of the way. This is a man who is a shepherd of a flock, most of whom are African-American, most of whom don't have the means where they can write a check and go to the school that's best for them, to go to a school that they can get a good education at, to go to a school where they're going to be able to avoid being in harm's way. What Dr. Carson knows in the heart of Houston, Texas, is the same thing that people truly know in their heart for those who live in rural Texas. We care about all the kids here in the state of Texas. And because the House members have been able to realize that, they've been able to see something else. A lot of these arguments that have been put forward about why school choice should be rejected, in a way, really may not make full sense. They say things like, well, we need to fully fund education first. No one disagrees with that. Let's be clear. As governor, I have provided more funding for public education than any governor in the history of the state of Texas. <laughs> but listen, I want to make sure that we provide a carrot to make sure this legislation gets passed. The legislature has already set aside $4 billion to add to more funding for public education in the state of Texas. But I wrote the agenda for the special session as only addressing ESAs. Once ESAs are passed, I will put on the legislative call the full funding for public education, including teacher pay raises for teachers across the state of Texas. <laughs> the
They say the argument goes that there's going to be like a, a massive number of, of kids leaving these public schools, leaving the schools decimated and in, in low in number. It's simply false. We, we know that it's false, if, if nothing else, from having gone through uh, the charter school situation. The same argument was used back then, and there was no mass exodus from our public schools. Public schools are better than they've ever been. Similarly, there will be no mass exodus here. There's so many arguments put up against it that just make no sense because they, they try to shoot down something. And with these members of the House, they finally have been able to see through these false notions, saying things like there's these advertisements saying that, you know, school choice is going to end high school football as we know it. That's the most bogus thing. You're, you're desperate. You're desperate if your argument is high school football in Texas is over. Let me tell you one thing that will never be over, and that's high school football in Texas. But listen, as, as good as school choice is for parents and for the kids, one thing legislators have also come to grips with is how good it is for voters for their constituents. After all, each of these House members, they have a House district, and they have people who elect them to go to Austin, Texas. And what has been referenced a couple of times tonight already is poll after poll after poll after poll shows that Texans support school choice. It doesn't matter if you're black, if you're white, if you're Hispanic, if you're Indian American, Asian American, whatever the case may be, majorities of every group support school choice. But for those who are Republicans, and they may say, well, listen, you know, polls are one thing, but really what matters are, are the poll, I mean, what, who, who shows up and votes. The last time we had a primary in Texas, the issue of school choice was on the ballot, quite literally. Do you support school choice? And those who vote in Republican primaries, they cast a vote. And 88 percent of the people who go vote voted yes they want school choice in the state of texas for republican lawmakers it does not matter if you're in an urban core if you're in a suburban county or if you're in rural texas large majorities of the people who really go vote who will be going to vote this next February and March in your district, they want school choice. If you're going to vote your district as you want to do, you will vote in favor of school choice. But ultimately for me as governor of this great state, the issue actually is in addition to all those things. As governor, I want to see our education system perform better. So let me put this in some level of context. Where does Texas rank in the number of new jobs added in America? We're number one, and it ain't close. Texas ranks number one for economic development. I have governor's Trump trophies. I've won every single year that I've been governor. So there's a lot of Aggies here. And I know there's two words Aggies despise. Those two words are Nick Saban. <laughs> Especially after last Saturday, right? So here, here's the thing about Nick Saban. Nick Saban has won more national championships than any other coach. He's won like six or seven national championships. But to put that in context, every year that I'm in governor, for nine years in a row, Texas has won the national championship for economic development. I should have nine rings on my fingers. <laughs> Far outpacing Nick Saban. I should be the one doing those Aflac commercials, not Nick Saban. 
We're number one for the most tier one research universities. We have the largest medical center in the entire world. And the list goes on and on. Where does Texas rank in public education? What is our aspiration for where we should rank in public education? Yeah, exactly. If, if, if anybody came up with a number other than the number one, you are no longer a Texan. We believe in, in only one number in the state, Texas to be number one. What is the pathway for Texas to go down in order for us to be number one for public education? Let's, let's look at the facts. Let's look at the facts. There is a study that comes out every year of the top 100 public high schools in the United States. It came out in June for this past year. The state that ranks number one for the most Schools in the top 100 public high schools, Arizona. The state that ranks number two, Florida. What do those two states have in common? They are the top states in the United States for school choice. School choice makes public education even better. School choice will put us on a pathway to get there. As Brooke was talking about earlier, she said, we are going to finish. We're close to your last words. And by God, we are going to finish. One way or the other, we're going to finish. But also, as has been pointed out, this is something that's been in the process of working for a while since 1989, when Jim Leininger first organized this effort and set Texas on the mission to pass school choice. Well, let me put all this in the context of something that would be personal to me, something I don't talk about. I, I did talk to a small group of you all about before, but I'm going to make it a little more personal. What we are doing is that we are running a relay race, a race that began with Jim Leininger carrying the baton, this story is replicated time and again over the course of history. The lead runner begins, runs a lap, and then hands that baton off to a teammate. That teammate takes it and runs it again. Jim began in the year 1989, and he gets responsibility and praise for the first decade. 1999, the baton was picked up by leaders at TPPF and carried it to 2009. The third picked it up in 2009 and carried it to 2019. In 2019, the baton was handed off to me. I have the baton in my hand. It's my job to carry it to the finish line. This is something that I want to show you I began before. That's me carrying a baton, running that race, crossing the finish line, carrying in that baton the sweat and the efforts of my three other teammates who got me to where I was so that I could finish the race. My teammates are the activists who've been involved from this since 1989. My teammates are the members of the Texas House and Texas Senate who join with me in this effort, not for me to finish the race, but for our kids to finish the race. And I am committed, however long it takes, that race is going to continue. I will not stop until we get ESAs passed in the state of Texas.
Our parents are worth it. Our kids are worth it. Our state is worth it. Working together, we will not be Texas Longhorn football. (laughs) Working together, for the next few weeks, we will call innovative plays. We will be flexible enough that we will not be stubborn and run the same play that we've run in the past. We are going to choose plays that will get us across that goal line. We're going to score. We're going to win the game for the future of our kids. God bless you all, and God bless the great state of Texas.